Okay, so we're going to look a bit more at phylogenetic trees. So we had uh, Rob Cruikshank this morning talking about the trees themselves and how we look at them, how we interpret them and so on. And then we had Cor Vink, um, who was looking at how we use trees in terms of finding the trees, looking at closest relatives, maybe looking at when things happened and so on. Uh, what I'm going to follow on from is to look at how we other, other ways in which we use the trees, to look at how we might reconstruct uh, what happened in the past, maybe the kinds of traits that our ancestors had, uh, and so on. And so quite often, you know, in, in scholarship exams, you'll find trees are being used. And one of the things you'll be asked about uh, is, you know, what does this mean, this particular trait distribution over a whole bunch of different species and they have a particular type of trait. Um, and, you know, what does that actually mean when you look at an evolutionary tree? So we'll look at a little bit of that as we go along. Uh, and then we'll look more broadly at sort of, I guess, cultural evolution. Um, there's often questions about genes in humans um, and what that means. You know, if you find a gene for a particular thing, what does it actually mean uh, in terms of how it affects human species and or other? And we'll look at the link between biological cultural evolution and, and humans and in penguins. So a lot of my research over the last decade or so has looked at uh, what behaviour tells us about penguin evolution uh, and sometimes about what evolution tells us about penguin behaviour. Now the thing about, <clears throat> that's good about working on penguins is that we all know what a penguin is, okay? And hence we, we see the little guys standing around on the ice and, and so on, waddling about. Um, and we can't say that for a lot of the other bird groups. A lot of the other bird groups, you, you know, it's a bit of a grey area between certain types of animals, like if it's a gull as opposed to a skewer or something along those lines. But a penguin is a penguin. And even within the penguins, we're pretty good with our, our genera, okay, the, the various groups, the subdivisions uh, within the penguins. Um, they're pretty well known, they're very robust. So that's a useful thing as well. But what we generally lack is the actual phylogeny of the penguins themselves, the evolutionary tree. Well, we did up until about nine years ago, uh, and there's been a bit of work since uh, sort of fine-tuning this result. But we have what we call a robust tree. Now, remember Rob talked about trees uh, this morning and that the numbers on the branches sometimes or quite often refer to the kind of how robust the tree is, how much confidence we have that that branch is in the tree. Okay, so if it's there, well, we often see it as either a percentage, so if it's there 100% of the time, then all of the data supports that particular branch. Uh, or it might be as a uh, proportion, so... 1.0 or 0.99 actually means that there's a huge amount of support from the data for that branch. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a, like a true uh, tree, if you like, that branch is real. We don't know that for certain. But what we can say is that based on all the data we've collected, uh, that there's nothing contradictory, contradicting what we've found. And so what we can see here, uh, if we look at this evolutionary tree for penguins, is that all the crested penguins in red here uh, come out together closely allied with this orange branch here, the yellow eye penguin. Uh, the South American and South African penguins are in this sort of light green, whereas the flippid, white flippid and little blue penguins come out here in this green. Uh, the, the small Antarctic penguins come out together, and then the big Antarctic penguins come out together. Then there are a whole bunch of other things here called, um, well, which are actually outgroups. They're not penguins. And what we actually want them for, and Robert alluded to this this morning, is an outgroup will actually allow us to know where this branch here that joins into the living penguins actually connects into. Because if we didn't have the outgroups, we wouldn't necessarily know which was the oldest part of the tree, okay, which was ancestral to the rest. But here, because we've got all these other um, birds, which we know aren't penguins, and we see that they actually join on at this point, we know that the emperor and the king penguins are probably the first lineage to to diverge out of the living penguins today. So we have this really good tree. It tells us a lot about um, the penguins as we know them today. Now the thing about uh, penguins is also we can observe their behavior, and a lot of people have done this, and we can, um, we can look at how these behaviors potentially evolve through time. So here's a behavior, a hunch submissive display, which is one where, you know, you can imagine you're a colony bird, you've got to get through the you know, whole colony, go past all these nests to get to your nest, maybe you're at the back of the colony. Now, birds are always to be pretty jealous, penguins are no different to uh, animals coming past them. And uh, they don't, you know, they don't want someone waddling past, they might stand on their egg, try and take their nest, do something like that. So they'll kind of lunge at them and try and fight them. Now, if you're bringing your little supply of fish up to your chicken in the colony, you don't want to fight your way through the whole colony. So what we have is a hunched missive display. So the animal coming through the colony 
kind of bends itself down as much as possible and looks you know, as small as possible perhaps. Uh, whereas the other animals around it, they tend to rise up. So it's kind of no doubt that you're saying, you know, I'm not worthy, please don't beat me up uh, as they move through the colony. <clears throat> and so this means you get a whole lot less aggression because it's not in the interest of anyone to have a bit of a scrap uh, all day long as penguins come past. So we know there's hundreds of missive displays found throughout um, various of the penguin species, and we also know that there are different forms of it, right? There's slightly different ways in which they hunch their body, or they use their wings, or they give calls, uh, and so on. So there's a whole bunch of other types of behaviours that we could also measure. Um, there are things like where the chicks are fed every day during the first weeks of, of incubation, simple yes or no. There are things which are actually the result of behaviour. So vegetation present at the nest site or burrow, yes or no, effectively. Um, of course, whether there's a tree growing next to your nest is not a behaviour, but it is a behavioural decision to put the nest next to a tree. So in one way or the other, we're actually figuring out something about behaviour. And then there are those more simple types of behaviours, uh, in this case an aggressive behaviour called gaping and open yell, whether it's present or not. So we can take those behaviours and we can look at how they might have evolved. All right, so let's take um, <clears throat> a particular behaviour called treading. Uh, this is a courtship behaviour, and uh, pretty much it's when the, the male jumps up onto the back of the female and kind of gives her a foot massage, uh, effectively. And what we find is that it's present in all the penguin species except for the emperor and the king. So if that's the case, and we think back to that tree, what that implies is that this behaviour of treading arose at this point on the evolutionary tree, okay, after the emperor and king had diverged, but before the rest of the other penguin species uh, diverged. That's if it's homologous, okay? That is if it's arisen once and has been passed on, this behaviour has been passed on um, from parent to offspring, offspring, parent to offspring, 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 and so on, through to the present day. Of course, it could have be it could have arisen more than once. Okay, it could be what we call homoplasius, this particular behaviour. It might have been just a really common solution to, uh, to initiating courtship, for example. And it might have evolved up to at least 13 times, because we find it in 13 different penguin species. So what we can do with the tree is we can say, well, which is more likely? And in this particular case, we would say, well, it's either happened once and been passed on, or it's happened multiple times, and we just end up with a behaviour that looks the same. Okay, it's evolved multiple times separately, um, but it's actually it their own particular behaviours. And we can say, well, which is more biologically likely? Okay, because we don't know this. Maybe we could test something. Go out there with some more and um, some new eyes and look at the behaviour afresh, and find that actually every time we look at what we think is the same behaviour, there's subtle differences. But it seems more likely from a what, what parsimony point of view, which is. Make it basically take the simplest explanation that it's likely it just arose once, it's been passed on uh, to all the descendants rather than convergently ar um, arisen multiple times. So this idea of homology and homoplasia is quite an important one when it comes to uh, evolution. All right? Bec you know, you think about a system like eyes. Okay, think of the sorts of things that might have eyes. I mean, obviously vertebrates have eyes, we have eyes. Um, we have things like insects have eyes, spiders have eyes, we just looked at a lot of those this morning, and spider eyes are quite different to insect eyes, um, squid, you know, mollusks have eyes in all sorts of different ways, uh, so very sophisticated things like squid, very similar eyes to us, right through to scallops, which you can only really tell the difference between sort of light and no light. But the thing we know about these is when we look at the structure of these eyes, that they're different. Okay, so eyes, eyes seem to have arisen multiple times. All right? Our eyes and the vertebrate system are quite different to what we find in insects. They do the same job, but they're different eyes. So it's not like we had an ancestor a long time ago who evolved eyes, and then we've just inherited them all since for both insects, say, and mammals. What happened, we have an ancestor which probably didn't have eyes, or certainly not in the way we think about them, but we have independently evolved organs to detect light. Now, how they detect light is quite different. So that's the difference between homology and homoplasy. Okay, so what about another behaviour? Here's another one called bill hiding. This is another one uh, which is to do with courtship, where basically, it's, as it says on the label, the animals are kind of looking at one another, and one of them will hide their bill down below their flipper, I guess, looking very chic and mysterious. So what we find is that it's present in the crested penguins, and it's present in the sphiniscus penguins. Um, so it's about nine penguins overall. But it's not found in yellow-eyed penguins, as far as we know, or in the little penguins. 
So if it's a homologous trait that is it evolved in the past, okay, at this point here, it would have had to have been lost in this branch here, leading to the yellow eye penguins and to the little penguins, and been retained in these other two branches. If it's a homoplasious um, scenario and it's arisen twice, then it would have arisen once in the crested penguins, potentially, and once in the sphiniscus penguins. Okay, and again, we can say, well, which is biologically more likely? Well, there's two events here if it's homoplasious, three events here, so you get one, two, three, if it's homologous. So from straight parsimony, we might expect that this is homoplasious. But of course, we also have to look at it from a biological point of view and say, well, you know, it's a relatively complex behaviour. And for it to have evolved to be exactly the same and happen in exactly the same um, context, okay, courtship, um, between partners and so on, you know, it seems slightly unlikely that you get exactly the same thing. So this one's a little bit trickier. You know, you might err on the side that it's probably homologous, but, you know, we're not entirely sure. So that's one way in which we can look at, uh, trace, put these traits back on an evolutionary tree. Another thing we can do is we can say, well, how long have these, these traits been around? Um, so, for example, treating. Well, if treating is homologous, and it, it would have arisen somewhere around this point. And if we go down to this timeline, so here's this evolutionary tree. The branches are proportional to uh, the amount of change along that, the genetic distance, if you like, along those branches, and therefore proportional to time. We're looking at something which happened about 35 million years ago, plus or minus. Okay, these bars here around each of these, what we do, the nodes, uh, where the trees join up, the branches join up, give us a kind of estimate of the, or how much confidence we have, or if, I guess the range in which uh, it's likely that this branch occurred. And so you can see that it could be more as recent as something like uh, 32, 31 million years ago, or potentially back about 38 million years ago. But sometime in that period, treading probably evolved. So this means that this behavior has been around for a long, long time. Okay, tens of millions of years, and it's been passed on. If we look at Bill Whiting, and if this is homologous as, as well, then we're looking at something which has been around for about 25 million years. But even if it was has arisen twice, it um, was present in the crested penguins, okay, so it would have had to have been around for at least the last five to eight million years, uh, and Sphiniscus penguins, which is this group here, similar sort of time. Regardless, here we have behaviours which are persisting for long periods of evolutionary time. So that's kind of neat. Another thing we can do is we can reconstruct uh, what's actually happened deep in the tree. So we might be interested in finding out, well, what did the ancestral penguin do? You know, what was it likely to have done? What's our best guess based on the data? And so what we can do is we can say, okay, well, what behaviours um, did you have, say, the emperor and king penguins have? Uh, and you can trace it back and say, well, <clears throat> if they share a behaviour, then it's likely that their ancestor had that behaviour. And we can do the same thing, following back a behaviour through these trees, saying what was most likely going to be happening here, what was most likely to be there, and so on. And we can get back to this point. Okay? And so with some probability around it, we can say, bred in summer, short nest preparation, nested environments, little vegetation, so probably a high latitude uh, animal, crushed chicks, molted in late summer, uh, and general lack of complex behaviours because many of the really complex courtship displays tend to evolve much more recently in the tree. So there's nothing particularly earth-shattering there. They would have been generic penguins. We know there were lots of penguins around for a long period of time before the living penguins, um, and so this kind of fits what little we know. But we can use this to estimate what happened uh, in the ancestors. Okay, so we can take these evolutionary trees and they can tell us a whole lot more um, about the past, the evolutionary past. So that's one cool thing to, to look at uh, when it comes to, to evolutionary trees. They're, they're like a time machine going back and telling us about the past. Now, what, I think, what I'm going to finish off with now is I'm going to take this idea that actually behaviour is, you know, it can actually be around over evolutionary time uh, and that it's important to think about this when, you know, you might get a question on what is this, uh, you know, the fact that we have these behaviours, what does that actually mean? Um, from an evolutionary viewpoint, you know, you have to think about it in terms of evolutionary time, okay? So, <clears throat> we'll change our, you know, from penguins to people, uh, and we'll just look at this particular study, which is called the United Kingdom Millennium Cohort Study, which has been running now for the uh, last decade or so. And what they're basically doing is they're measuring a whole bunch of people, um, well, thousands of people uh, in the UK, and they're kind of looking at their lifetime changes, if you like, 
what actually happened. So from a, if these were any other species, we'd say this is an ecological study. We're looking at environmental conditions and how they impact on the life histories of a particular, this particular species, in this case, humans. And so they collect all sorts of interesting data. So just to, just to look at uh, one aspect. So here we have a graph where we have maternal age and years from the age 20 through to 32. And what we're looking at is neighbourhood quality along this axis, which is effectively like uh, deciles ratings of schools, where 10 is the highest rating, okay, in terms of quality, however that was measured, um, whereas 1 is the lowest quality, however it was measured. And so effectively what we find is that there's this very strong relationship between high quality and older maternal age. Okay, so basically women tend to put off having their children until later when they're living in high quality environments, but when they're in a very low quality environment they have children relatively early. Uh, we can look at things like mean birth weight. So mean birth weight follows a similar type of pattern, higher birth weights in higher quality environments if you like, as opposed to low uh, in lower quality environments. Now why is that important? Well, you think about when a child is born, what information do we give them? Well, we give them their name, sometimes. Sometimes we don't have the name sorted. The parents, so people know who, who had the baby. And we usually give them the weight. Now, think about it. I mean, because it's such a common thing, we probably don't think about it. Oh, you know, they had a baby. Oh, how much did it weigh? I mean, you could just as easily say, was it hairy? Did it have blue eyes? How long were its arms? I mean, you could ask all those kinds of things. But we don't, we ask about weight. And it turns out that the good reason for that, because weight is the best predictor that we have for health and success of you know, evolutionary fitness, if you like, later in life. Okay, it's the best one we have. If you have a really, you know, reasonably good sized baby, it'll do pretty well in all sorts of measures later in life. And so it is an important factor, and clearly in football order from the point of view of this graph, because those that are going to be healthy and do pretty well in life <clears throat> in terms of their health and fitness. Um, will be coming from these higher quality environments. A couple other things, we've got breastfeeding duration, which we know is linked to um, health of, of the baby and development of baby. Again, this relationship um, increasing as you get higher quality environments. Paternal involvement follows exactly the same pattern. Fathers have much more of a role to play as the environment uh, is increased, and perhaps that part of the, the quality measure. Okay, so, and there are a whole bunch of other things, but, you know, what we can see here is that from a point of view of, of the environment that humans are living in, you know, this fits very nicely with things like R and K type selection, where if you're in an environment where you uh, are doing very well, you quite often put huge amounts of investment into just a few offspring to make them extremely competitive. If you're in an environment where it's not a great environment, then you tend to breed earlier and potentially have more offspring so that some of them will survive. And we're seeing the same basic things happen even in a very modern society. So this Millennium Cohort study is a really good one to be watching over time. But it shows you that we, you know, even as humans, we, we follow strict sort of ecological and evolutionary patterns. Okay, another thing that we can think about is um, obesity. All right, so it's a common complaint within our um, modern society. And often people can make the link between the fact that in modern society we seem to have a lot of sedentary behaviour. All right, you guys have uh, been sitting here most of the day. You probably came out in a bus or a car where you sat down. You know, when you get home, you might do some study. You might get on a PlayStation. You might watch some television, internet, whatever. You're going to be sitting around a lot. All right, so we, we seem to tend to sit around doing not a lot a lot of the time. And we don't, you know, we might go for a run every now and then or play some sport, but that's only for a short part of the day. And so maybe this is one of the problems that we have, that, you know, modern society uh, tends to be built um, with, you know, doing less, if you like. And also, the fact that you can actually be very successful without doing a great deal of physical prowess. Uh, we don't actually get up and beat people up now, or, you know, thump our chests or anything like that. I mean, a lot of being successful in a modern society is about using information, obtaining information and using that information. And so the question then becomes, well, is this sedentary behaviour then a maladaptation? That is, something which was potentially useful in the past, but is no longer useful. Okay, now the thing about evolutionary traits is that there are always a trade-off between positive and negative attributes. Okay, there's always some good things, want of a better word, and bad things 
uh, about any particular trait. So let's put ourselves back uh, to our Homo sapien ancestors. Let's go back, say, I don't know, 50,000 years and think about what we were, you know, what were we likely doing at that time. Uh, any ideas? Yep. So, you, yeah, so hunting, yep, and gathering, absolutely. And then we would, uh, you know, be in small kinship groups, perhaps. Uh, we think about 120 is pretty typical for hunter-gatherer groups, uh, at least like a little small tribe or clan um, that we would have associated with at that time. So that was the kind of thing that we were, that we were living in. So what we're looking at here is, well, what kind of positive um, traits, if you like, uh, well, what was positive about being sedentary, you know, not moving around a lot, and then what was negative back then, 50,000 years ago? Okay, well, there's probably a number of things. Obviously, sitting around you know, the campfire or in the cave or wherever we were, you know, we would acquire knowledge and learning. You know, we might find, oh, that's a good place to go and find fish, or you know, I found a whole lot of game trails up in this place. You know, we could actually pass information on, or what's the best way to, to stick the end of the spear on a stick? You know, I found this little trick. You know, all those things would be passed on. Obviously, you're conserving energy. You know, if you're not sure when your next meal's coming from, you've got to be very careful. You've got to be, you know, if you're not actually going out using your energy to find more energy, then you should be conserving energy. So you're going to do that by sitting around. You're just avoiding predation. The more you move around the landscape, the more likely something's going to eat you, um, or attack you at least. And so you can sort of get around the predation issue. Obviously, you're holding your territory if you were there, your resources, and often your mate. Okay, so if the men tend to go off and go off hunting for days on end, uh, you know, you're leaving your female unguarded, and that always raises a bit of a problem. So you're kind of keeping an eye on each other at that point. From a negative point of view, well, when you're in a group, disease transmission occurs. Um, so you see that in modern society, you know, students are all at the university, getting close to exams, getting a bit stressed, they're in big populations, breathe on each other, cough on each other, pass on um, viruses and so on. Even the same thing would have happened then. Obviously, there's a bit of competition and aggression within a small group, uh, so that's more likely to happen if you're all sitting around in one place. And of course, you're not actually going out and getting resources. But I guess the point is that those negative things are actually fairly small compared to all the positives of actually being sedentary. Okay, so there were some, you know, there's good reasons why when you're not being really reactive, you should be really sedentary in our ancestors. Okay, what about today? What are the advantages? Well, I guess we've still got those time for social interactions, and of course. We are socially interacting more and more and more, uh, and so that gives us a chance to, to build those networks up. Uh, peer bond building, of course, with your with your partner, uh, it's always good for, for making sure that that's solidified. Get some bit of mate guarding going on in there as well. Knowledge acquisition is becoming more and more important. All right, we are the most specialised of all the species on the planet, and we are able to become specialised because we are able to pass information to one another. We're able to learn about our role. Okay. All right, many of you will be going off to university and you'll be learning to do something very specific. Maybe being a doctor, maybe being a lawyer, uh, maybe being an engineer, whatever it happens to be. But the thing is, you're not going to be able to do all those other jobs that, you know, you're not going to be able to wire up your house um, and so on. You leave that to someone else who is specialised to do that. You'll do your job, they'll do their job. That's what we do well. And we do that because we can have all this time for learning. You know, you guys can sit around for a couple of hours and hear about evolutionary trees. And it's really helpful. What about negatives? Well, of course, the problem now is that there's a lot of disease transmission. The bigger the population, the more likely the disease is going to spread. Um, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular issues, all these things increase by um, us sitting around a whole lot. So I guess the point is that these negatives have become much larger, relatively speaking, than what they were, say, 50,000 years ago. Still a lot of positives. I mean, you've got to have some sedentary time. But now the negatives have actually become much larger. Okay, so we can ask this question though, and we have to be very careful about this, because uh, one of the sports um, people came to me and said, look, you know, we're worried about obesity, blah, 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 what, just think about it from an evolutionary viewpoint, what do you think? And I said, well, do we know that our ancestors were more sedentary, uh, well, we're not as sedentary as we are? Okay, do we know that for a fact? They went, well, no, but of course they must have been more active because they were out chasing mammoths and things. And I said, well, that's a good point, but let's, let's make sure we can figure that out. So how do we figure that out? Of course, we can't go back in time and have a look, but what we can do 
is we can look at some of the hunter-gatherer societies that are still on the planet or have been measured over the last few decades that had very little contact with the outside world. We can do things like time budget. How much time do they spend in activities and what do they do? And so we were able to do that uh, and measure it. And interestingly, it turns out that we actually have very similar levels of sedentary behaviour. Okay, almost identical between our hunter-gatherer colleagues and our modern society, which came as a bit of a surprise. Um, well, yes, we're all a big surprise. Now, there are some differences. Uh, firstly, the way that hunter-gatherers hunter actually in some ways spend more time being sedentary, because when they're sedentary, they really don't do a great deal at all. But when they're active, they're pretty active. Okay, And so it all kind of averages out to about the same as us. Whereas we tend to be, you know, we'll walk around from buildings to building, or we'll walk to work, or we'll go for a run. So we tend to spend energy like that, whereas we also spend a lot of time being sedentary, and it kind of evens out to be very similar. The thing that we have that's just mainly different is we have lots of energy-dense foods. We don't, we don't need to worry about where the next meal's coming from, uh, because we've got food everywhere we look. And so that seems to be uh, one of the problems, as well as the way we burn our energy now, which is maybe potentially causing this issue with things like obesity and so on. Okay, so that's looking, you know, again, at, a, at sort of at the bigger picture. What about more specifically, you know, if we look at behaviours and how they might evolve over time? You know, we can ask this question, are humans promiscuous? Okay, why is that an interesting question? Well, we know that animals put a lot of effort into selecting potential mates for their, you know, to have as the, the, the parent of their children. Okay, so there's a lot of courtship behaviour goes on, a lot of assessment goes on. Uh, but do we also know that you know, once you form a pair bond and so on, that there's also you know, promiscuity happening where um, one of the, or other of the numbers of the pair bond actually look at other individuals outside the pair bond. And so it actually turns out when you do these surveys that around about 70% of humans display adulterous behaviour at least sometime in their life. Now this can be pretty low key. I mean this is just doing this once and it might be something fairly harmless, if you like, or uh, not of major concern, uh, right through to having you know serial affairs with you know everyone around you, sort of thing. But that's quite a big number. But the key point is that how many of these actually become something more? Okay, and about 28% of males have what we call extra pair copulations. Okay, so they take it from just flirt of flirting or whatever to something a bit more serious. What about females? Well, it turns out that they are usually a little bit less, uh, although in most studies, 22% compared to 28% is not significantly different. Okay, so it's likely that they might be just a little less likely to be promiscuous, but still about a quarter of all individuals are prom promiscuous. At least once in their lives. Okay, so this seems like a real concern then. Evolution should... You know, if you spend all this time and energy in building a pair bond and that, you should be protective of it. Uh, and so some recent research looked at this and said, well, how, how do humans actually go about guarding their pa partners from, from poaching, if you like, from, from other individuals? And so what we have is um, a couple of different strategies that could happen. It could be that you might focus on your partner. So you keep an eye on your partner and, and you look at that your partner and you're not so much worried about what everyone is doing around you, but you just check that they are behaving, if you like, that they're uh, keeping you know, true to you. And this is why, if, if you're into basketball, this could be what we call person-to-person -person defense. Or it could be that you're actually looking around you and you're, you're not so much focusing on your, your partner, but you're actually looking at, um, you know, let's say um, you're the female and you're worrying about your husband or your boyfriend and you look around and you're actually focusing on other women and just seeing what they're doing and if any of them are directing looks uh, or anything towards your partner. So you're actually look, not looking at your partner, you're looking outside at possible threats. And so this is what we might call in basketball a zone defense. Okay? And so this leads to a whole bunch of questions that were tested. Are women more sensitive to infidelity than men, for example, you might expect? Uh, that women are better at detecting these kinds of behaviours. It makes more difference to the to the woman, okay, on these situations. Why is that? Well, it's because the woman actually has the child, uh, so it makes a big difference that she gets the decisions right. If women are more sensitive about the possibility of infidelity, are they more accurate in their detection? 
uh, women just better at detecting behavioural cues in general. Maybe they're just better. Men are just more oblivious. Um, and in terms of rival sensitivity hypothesis that was mainly tested in this research, the hypothesis was that men were more was that more sen men sorry men are more sensitive to their own partner's behaviour, and women are more sensitive to other women in their mates' vicinity. Okay, so they tested all sorts of things. So one of them, they were asked, given this particular scenario, you know, is this a potential threat of infidelity? Your partner has a close friend from high school, is a member of the opposite sex, they talk a lot over the phone and share personal stories and they often meet alone. Okay? And so it turned out that women tended to rate those kinds of incidents as potential for threats of infidelity far more than men. They were also given lots of photos like this, and you had to identify the one that looked, you know, that where there might be infidelity occurring. So in this one here, the woman seemed to have walked in on something, uh, whereas the others are, are much more harmless. Turns out that women are faster at finding these things. Uh, they are a few seconds ahead of the men, but more importantly, they had greater accuracy. Okay, so we were saying that one there, but you may or may not be right. Women were generally right. So there's this issue about, well, are women just better at detecting these types of things? So they had another study like this where they had the same types of pictures, but they also threw in a, a dangerous animal, like a venomous snake, um, just to see in addition to infidelity. And what they found was that while the women were much better at detecting the, uh, the infidelity threats, the men were at a slight edge in detecting poisonous animal threats. So, you know, we were detecting different things. And then they had this other neat... Um, kind of study where they were looking at filming people in a bar like this and they were looking at say you have a couple sitting there and uh, there's a female sitting at the bar and you're looking at where do the men and the woman look. The men tend to look at the female if there was say a guy sitting there they'll look at their partner a whole lot more the direction of their eyes was being measured whereas if it's a female sitting there the, the woman is looking more at her than the partner. So it turned out that men were more likely to see within couple threats, so changes behaviour of their partner. Women were more likely to see outside threats, changes of behaviour of people of other women in the vicinity. But men were 20 times weaker than women. Okay, so while men could see within couple threats, it was far less likely to see anything than a woman. Uh, ultimate overall. Okay, so you know, my wife says, "Did you see the way she was looking at you?" And go, "No, I'm 20 times less likely to see that than you are." And so this tended to support the, the rivalry sensitivity hypothesis um, with men tend to focus on their partner whereas women tend to focus on other women around the area of their partner. Okay, so <clears throat> when you look at this kind of research it suggests that we're not as, um, I don't know, more, we don't have as much free will as we think we do in these situations, that we tend as a population to respond in certain ways. Now, the important thing from an evolutionary viewpoint, the thing to really emphasise in any questions which talk about, you know, maybe there's a gene for this kind of behaviour or, or something, is that all it means is that you're more likely, if you have that gene, you're more likely to perform that behaviour. It doesn't mean you will perform that behaviour. Okay, and that's quite a crucial distinction to make. Okay, because it's not, you know, we can all think of times when people act differently to what we've talked about in these, these things, uh, these scenarios, if you like, or whatever. It's actually, you know, what's more important is that if you take 100 people, then they'll tend to do this. 100 males will tend to be like this, 100 females will tend to do that, but not every male and will do what the males do, and not every female will do what all the females are doing, and so on. But it does raise this kind of interesting question, well, what drives all these um, connections? What drives the, you know, the fact that these behaviours are shared uh, through populations? And this is where we start to get these ideas that you get genes for particular behaviours and so on. Now here's another study, this one from New Zealand actually, where they've been following about a thousand people for the last few decades, and these are people born in Dunedin in the early 70s. Uh, and Moffat and Caspi have measured all sorts of things, but for today we're interested in a group of boys, uh, 155, who were maltreated between the ages of 3 and 11. And the maltreating uh, was either you know acute one-off thing that happened, or it could have been chronic things that happened over many years. So there was a lot of range of things that happened to these boys. Now what they were doing is they were looking at the presence of this particular gene called the MAOA gene. Um, now, if we take the MAOA gene in mice and we knock it out, that is, we stop it working, it means that the aggression levels of these mice is increased, 
and the evidence suggests the same thing happens in humans. So what MAOA seems to be is a gene which allows individuals to live better in social groups. You know, think about to those penguins walking through colonies. All right, this is a gene which allows these individuals to stop fighting all the time and allow just to go. Okay, we don't need to worry about fighting at the moment because they're part of the group or my colony or whatever it happens to be. But the thing is that within these genes, depending on which uh, version you have, you have those which have low activity. Um, which, if you like, aren't making as much protein, and you have these individuals are more aggressive, and we have high activity MAOA genes, which are the more social genes that are people, if you like, are the ones that have, are able to work together in groups a lot more. And what Moffat and Caspi have tested was whether this upbringing or genes or a combination of both contributed to antisocial behaviour and criminality. You know, whether these people ended up going to court, doing things they shouldn't have been, all that sort of stuff and they've been able to test that over the last few decades. All right, so let's take this uh, nice little table here. So what we have is whether you were treated well when you grew up, which is the vast majority of, of boys in the study, and you had a high activity gene, then you have an average measure of antisocial behavior. We'll call it R, with it. no point in putting a number in, which won't mean anything particularly, because what we're interested in is relatively speaking what happens when you were maltreated, but you had the high activity gene, well, it turns out you had just that same average measure of antisocial behaviour, so nothing changed. If you were treated well but had the low activity gene, which is in 37% of men, you also had about the average measure of antisocial behaviour. But if you were maltreated and had the low activity gene, you were four times more likely to have offended, uh, to have ended up in jail, and so on. Okay, so you didn't actually do well later in life. So if, in a sense, you need to have the, the bad gene and the bad environment um, for the consequences of this low activity gene uh, to become an issue. That's with men. Why are we focusing on them? Because it's much rarer in women. Because MAO, MAOA is found on the end of the X chromosome. X chromosome, women have two copies. You need to have both of the copies. Um, have to show the low activity gene before you get low activity. Um, in the men, you've only got one copy of this gene, so half the time, you know, if you get a low activity gene, it will be expressed. So you're just more likely to, to have this one expressed because of the, the X chromosome. But exactly the same thing happens. In this case, though, only 12% of girls have two copies of the low activity gene, which will then be the one that's expressed. But they have exactly the same problems, much more likely to offend, much more likely to be criminal, to be antisocial, and so on. So this... You know, so here we have a direct link between genes and behaviour, uh, such that we can actually, we you know, this leads to all sorts of legal issues or moral issues, because here we have some data which says that if a, if you find a child who's been mistreated and you then find they have a low activity uh, MAOA gene, then they are four times more likely to end up being violent or criminal later in life. So what do we do about that? You know, on one hand, we can say, well. You know, if we find a child, they haven't done anything, so we can't penalise them or change them or do anything about it because they haven't done anything at this point. But then what happens if 15 years later they beat up, you know, someone on the street, kill them, whatever, and you say, well, yeah, we thought this could happen, or we had a pretty pretty high probability that this would happen. Um, that's not going to be much help to the family of that particular person. So what could we do? Well, that's an interesting question. It's one you guys... Is, uh, in the next generation are going to have to deal with because we are going to be finding these links between genes, expression of genes and behaviour a whole lot more uh, because we know that this is an issue. Right? It's not just that there might be a change, there almost certainly will be a change in those situations. And potentially in the future, um, you know, we're going to be at the point where we could actually potentially go and alter those genes and make them high activity genes so they become more social. So we could actually engineer these genes to, be, to maybe solve the problem, but then should we? don't know. It's part of the discussion that we should potentially have. Just as another example of where we have a direct link between a behaviour and, and, a, and a gene region. So this one called DARP32 seems to be linked with human rage. Um, and there are at least three different versions of the gene. Okay, So you have the whole gene and on that gene there are these just two positions, uh, two base pair positions. One where it's TC, one where it's TT, and one where it's CC. Now the thing about this is that if you have TC or TT, you have significantly more anger. That is, you're much more likely to become very angry um, if you possess those particular two base pairs in those positions than if you're a CC, where you're much less prone to getting angry. Again, so there's a very clear link. 
and this is a fairly important link. Um, so what do we do with this information? You know, is it something that, depending on the job, we should we could find out about? You know, if you were going to be a child care worker or something like that, then it might be nice to have the CC version rather than the others. Maybe if you're going into something like uh, uh, the army, it might be good to have the one which makes you, you know, you get angry a lot faster. Or, you know, who knows? The thing again is that in the next generation of time, we, you know, when you turn up to a job interview, it may well be that you actually have to have your own genome, sequenced genome, so that, we, that that can actually be looked at. Or to go further afield, you know, from a medical insurance point of view, you know, we are starting to find these genetic links to increasing or decreasing risks for um, heart problems or cancers and so on. And so it may be that, you know, our genomes, our particular mix that we have in our genomes may become much more explicitly used in the future. Now, whether we should do that or not is, a, you know, is something which needs to be discussed. Um, and our current legislation just can't handle it. Okay. Now, the thing about <coughs> genetics is that we could go for genetic counselling. Okay, this idea that we could look at genomes. And there's a great film that's probably worth looking at um, from about, I don't know, 15 odd years ago called Gattaca, uh, which looks at why, you know, the relatively near future now, um, where couples, you know, they meet and they think about taking it further, they actually take their genomes and compare them to see what sort of issues they have. Now, from a genetic counselling point of view, we're kind of already there for some genetic diseases. There are times when we know that things like Huntington's, that if these two people have children, they're very likely to have children with Huntington's disease, which is a pretty terrible disease. So perhaps they shouldn't have uh, children. Or when women are over, say, 35, they have an amniocentesis to check that there are no ab uh, chromosomal abnormalities in the developing child because it's much more likely in women that age uh, and potentially they can abort. These things are genetic counselling. Uh, it derives from a, a, a broader area of, um, called eugenics, uh, which has looked at at least over the last 100 odd years where people sought to make a, a better population, if you like, by selecting traits that were good or removing traits that weren't good. Now, the problem with a lot of these are that, although we've looked at a couple of situations where there's a direct gene for a particular behaviour, most of the time genes are only linked to a behaviour and they're one of many genes. And so that's another thing which is important when you're answering questions on you know, genes for something. You need to make say that yes, while there is a link between this behaviour or this structure or whatever in this gene, Chances are that there are several other genes which are also playing a role. It's much harder to be. Uh, it's much harder to to uh, change things in a population if you're actually trying to manipulate several genes that are on different chromosomes and so on at the same time. So it's important to remember that as well. Okay, so that pretty much wraps it up um, for me. So what we've looked at is these evolutionary trees, how we might use them to talk about what our ancestors did in the past, or the changes which have led to the development of the trait, the behavioural trait, or whatever trait we're looking at over the time. We can use evolutionary trees to tell us about that. Uh, and then I have kind of went more into the fact that, well, once we know that these traits have evolved, and particularly if they're linked to a particular gene, then, you know, how, what, what does that mean? You know, what does that mean for, what can we say about the link between uh, that particular trait and the gene and so on? And I think that I will leave it there. Good luck for your exams.